The food web is the web of life. There's a web of life in the soil, there's a web of life between plants, there's a web of life between insects and plants. There's a web of life in our gut. And that web of life is around food as the nourishment. There's a part of this country that sinks deeper into a black hole. Of course, fake news is the favorite word in the discourse this, these days. But you know, the really fake news has been around for more than 50 to 60 years. And that fake news is industrial agriculture, large-scale agriculture, monocultures, chemicals, GMOs, corporations feed the world. That was fake news the day it started. And it's continued. Um, sadly, because governments and corporations join hands to say that it was the corporations that came out of the war that would take control of our food system. And it's a system that I say is based, on, of course, on the mechanical mind, and that's the real border I'd like to cross, the boundaries of the mechanical mind which pretends that we are separate from nature, which pretends that nature is just dead matter, soil is just a container for pouring nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium into, that plants are just a machine for guzzling up fossil fuels and urea. Now that mechanical mind has got us into deep problems. But it has of course generated the extractive economy where profits lie and there are uh, big leaps being made on how to turn every crisis off that system into a new market opportunity. It is by necessity a, a monoculture paradigm. I've called it the monoculture of the mind. Because when you design something on external inputs and you know, mechanical systems have to be organized externally. Living systems evolve through self-organization. If you want a balanced diet, you have to have at least six tastes in your meals. The sweet, the sour, the salt, the bitter, the pungent, the astringent. Of course, there are all kinds of scientists now working on the fact that, that the gut is important. Ayurveda knew that it's a central process. Into calling it the microbiome. And of course finding the trillions of organisms. And in that I would include not just the organisms, I would include communities. And it never was the power or sanity of one man. It is by necessity a system that must lead to higher and higher concentration and therefore tends towards monopoly. And of course, not only do you get monopoly from concentration, you get monopoly from artificial um, illusions that corporations like Monsanto invent the seed. So there's a monopoly created by these fake property rights to invention of seed and of life. The seed failed frequently because it was not meant for dry areas, drought areas. It needed pesticides because the Bt does not succeed as a technology of pest control, nor does Roundup Ready technology succeed for weed control. I don't have to tell you that. But it must go hand in hand with militarism. After all these technologies came, from war, they are instruments of killing. Will, Will's book, uh, The War on Bugs, gives us the history of where pesticides came from. The concentration camps, the poison gases, even the chemical fertilizers came out of the explosive factories and ammunition factories, the same method of artificially fixing nitrogen by burning fossil fuels is the root of both ammunitions and bombs as well as uh, synthetic fertilizer, which is why you get fertilizer bombs turning up everywhere. Herbicides, Agent Orange, Vietnam War, all of this came out of a militarized mind. 
where everything was an enemy. The insects are your enemy. Every plant is an enemy. That's why you must kill them with herbicides. And small farmers are your enemy. And I believe small farmers are seen as an enemy because a system that is so violent in its thought and its implementation is a deeply afraid system. When you have to use that kind of power, you are afraid. And it's through my work over the decades on ecofeminism, I realized that this concentration of violence in capitalist patriarchy comes from the fear of everything that's alive and free. Now to the third world in the name of feeding the world. Punjab, the most fertile land, the proudest farmers, today is a ruined land. The soils are dead, the rivers are dying, 75% of the youth are drug addicts. I worked on it and that's how I realized the roots of the system. The violence was not accidental. It was structural, it was systemic. So the real fake news is this industrial system that produces commodities is not feeding the world. 90% of uh, the corn and soya in the world is going for biofuel and animal feed. 90%. Only 30% of food people eat comes from industrial farms. 70% even today, in spite of nearly 70 years of war against small farmers, it still comes from small farms. On the other hand, if we allow the industrial system, which is a warfare system, to increase slightly more, say up to 45%, we'd have a dead planet. Because the 30% supply has already destroyed 75% of the planet. In terms of soil, in terms of biodiversity, it's even more in terms of water. And 50% of all the greenhouse gases come from an industrial globalized system. So we started to look in Navdania when I started to, I started to save seeds because I just didn't like the idea of a Monsanto controlling all seed and pushing GM seeds and more toxics. I love life, I love biodiversity, I love freedom. And there's nothing that's going to come in my way of defending the freedom of life on earth. If food is nourishment, then that's what we should be measuring. Not only because, as Howard said, health is a continuum from the soil to the plants to the animals, including humans. The soil's health comes from the amazing living beings that populate it and create in it. A gram of soil, 50,000 algae, 400,000 fungi, including the mycorrhizal, teaspoon of living soil, one billion bacteria, which would become a ton. Do they measure that in yield per acre? It's missing. And in a square meter, a thousand earthworm at our farm, as the monsoon comes, I feel so happy. You know, you can't take a step without stepping on about 50 earthworm moles. And, um, Darwin wrote a book, I mean, they, they took up this survival issue and turned it into competition. But he wrote a book, he actually wrote two books, which is so important for our organic community. One is about the earthworm who mold. He says, when human history is written, it'll be recognized that this little earthworm had the most important role to play in the survival of our species. And there's another one on plants in which he describes the plant root and calls it the brain of the plant and now they are finding out it's a more complex neuron system than our brain. One plant has more neurological activity going on in its root zone than everything going on in our brain. And at one level people knew this but that idea of the soil as dead material, empty container, and the fertility comes from 
the applied nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is what has misled us for so long. Now, it's the organisms that create all the nutrients in the soil. Um, so diversity from the soil to the plants, to our plates, to our gut, is a survival mechanism. 75% of all non-communicable chronic diseases are coming from the diet. The combination of the fact that you're loaded with toxics, but also that your food is absolutely incomplete. It is nutritionally empty in a very deep way. And we should just stop talking of commodities as food. Small farms don't produce commodities, they produce food. The large-scale industrial farms produce commodities. We don't need more commodities. The world is drowning in commodities that are lowering the prices of food for the farmer, but increasing the price of food for the poor. I won't go into details of the fact that it's the gut bacteria that actually even manage our brain. That's why they're calling it the second brain. And the fact that we have an explosion of autism, Alzheimer's, all kinds of neurological problems is related to the fact that the food that's being eaten is killing our second brain. So organic farms, small farms, grow health. They grow real wealth. 300,000 farmers of India wouldn't have committed suicide if there wasn't the fake wealth equation being created. It's externality, but it's also a market opportunity because the same companies sell you the chemicals that make you sick. Then buyer comes around and has a patented cancer drug. So for them, the more you get sick, the bigger their market. The, as you know, Monsanto and Bayer have merged, Syngenta and ChemChina are merging, Dow DuPont have merged, and all the small seed companies have been sucked up by them. But they're reaching for the next level of monopoly. And that's the context in which the relevance of our small farms and organic farming becomes even more important. So two years ago, Monsanto bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation. And then very rapidly bought up the world's biggest soil data corporation. Renamed it Solum. It also bought up the world's biggest bee research institute because it was becoming clear the chemicals are killing the bees. And this is the future of agriculture that they see. Everything on the farm is being digitalized. From the atmosphere to the field to the soil, we are ingesting data about what's happening in the atmosphere, the rainfall, temperature, radar data from sat satellites and weather stations, data from farm machinery about how much fertilizer and pesticides are being sprayed. They call it spyware. Um, how much seed they're putting down and what kind of seed, the days, the farmers. Huh? Then drones and remote sensing platforms are looking at electromagnetic radiation light coming off the fields, giving information of crop health, and then there are new ways of observing the soil, picking up constant characteristics of chemical composition. Do they know the billions of bacteria? Does big data mean knowledge? No, it doesn't. You know, big data in a big ocean of ignorance is just more ignorance. Now, you're worried about your president? Read this. The whole place is full of adolescents who are playing Lego. Never grew up. And then the big data stuff is that they run algorithms. They know this is a salt tolerant seed. Then they run an algorithm over the hundred, thousands of salt tolerant seeds. And then as they write, we bet on the, and it's like a lottery. We bet on what will be the winning traits. They're paying lottery with life on this planet. So the combination of big data is ignorance, playing lottery and control. But can you imagine that the vision of the future 
is farming without farmers. Surveillance technologies everywhere. So do we want agriculture to be part of surveillance or a part of the deepest love that humanity can have for the earth? Are we going to allow our agriculture to be intelligence in terms of spying or intelligence in terms of the expression of life? Because life is intelligent. Life is not dead matter. They got it so wrong in the mechanical paradigm. Every cell is intelligent, every organism is intelligent, every human being is intelligent. The roots of intelligence, it, it comes from interlegory, means to make choices. The bacteria that becomes resistant to antibiotics is expressing its intelligence. And interestingly, a, a system that came out of exterminating people in the concentration camps, is again talking the language of extermination. You can spend all the money you want to try and reform who will occupy the White House after four years. But the true change will come from how we change the way we think about ourselves on this earth, about how we grow our food, how we relate to our other relatives in the earth family, because I do feel we all need to learn a lot more from the earth and her biodiversity. And we need to learn a lot more from those who have farmed for 10,000 years. They are amazing systems. Agriculture is not an invention. Agriculture is the ultimate co-evolution of human beings with the earth. It is the expression of the highest level of creativity, a non-violent creativity, not the violence of the systems that are, have destroyed so much and will destroy a little more and not find a solution. You know, we have, to, we have to move from the monoculture of the mind to the diversity of the mind. We have to move from the militarized mind to the mind of non-violence and peace with all creation. At least for me, the first reason I do it, it's the one place where I can return to the earth and say thank you every day. It's the place where we can give back.